Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Krish. I'm glad you mentioned those points of dispute. I, you, you missed a few. I'm sorry you didn't mention the Uyghurs, for example, and the hideous things that are happening to them. We can come back to this. In the sure. But now, right. go, now go to James Harrington, uh, founder of the Texas Civil Rights Project, and he's been a human rights attorney, and he's now, I believe, involved in ministry as well. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. I also uh, want to join in commending the folks of Turkey for their bravery and courage, and actually for uh, probably everybody on this panel today for their own personal courage and bravery. And it's an honor to be in this group with folks all around the world struggling for human rights. And I was reflecting, thinking about uh, Krisha's comments too. And I think uh, what we see in Turkey is reflecting what's going on around the world. Uh, we have the same struggle in the United States with Trump right now. And perhaps the thing that's gonna save us is the judiciary. And the judiciary, uh, we know of course, uh, theoretically and in practice is critical, important, essential to the safe functioning of any uh, democracy because it divides power. And with respect to the attack on the judiciary in Turkey and in the United States, in fact, uh, Trump and uh, Erdogan uh, used the same language about enemies of the people. Both are demagogues. What's different, I think, uh, is that with respect to Turkey and the United States and building a judiciary is that we've had 250 years to do it. And I think that's been critical. It's been it's set in stone in a sense, even though it's still not anywhere near perfect, it's still very malleable in terms of politics, but that that is a tradition and an institution we have. Turkey, on the other hand, has only really had 10 years of experience with an independent judiciary and not enough time that it became institutionalized. I think as Alp pointed out in his very uh, detailed uh, chart, uh, historically uh, in Turkey up until probably around 2000, the judiciary was nothing but a rubber stamp uh, for the government and, the, and complicit in the government's torture and abuse of uh, human rights. The history is sorted. But in uh, 2002, during that bright decade, when it looked like Turkey was reforming and coming uh, around as a human rights leader, or establishing democracy in uh, the Middle East. In fact, uh, when President Obama was elected, Turkey was the first country he visited because of that promise of change in the democracy. So in that bright decade, I'll call it, there was a very considerable effort to reform and strengthen the judiciary and to make it independent to put that into the culture. And the European Union, because Turkey at that time was doing this to some extent in order to uh, uh, join the European Union, the European Union uh, went ahead, went to uh, involve itself greatly in the prodding, training, financial support, of making the judiciary, helping to make the judiciary in Turkey independent. In fact, the goal uh, that uh, the EU embarked upon was training uh, 10,000 uh, lawyers and judges in the tradition of becoming independent, becoming a check on the executive, becoming a check on the legislative power. And I, was, I wrote a book, uh, the Fethullah Gülen's trials in Turkey, but that caused me to look very closely at uh, the judicial system and how it functioned. 
And part of writing that book uh, was to go interview judges and uh, prosecutors uh, in Turkey, which I did, uh, both at the trial level and also met at that time with the, with the judges of the Constitutional Court. And what was really striking to me was their dedication and interest in really forming an independent judiciary, really uh, bringing about this hope in Turkey to build a democracy in which the judiciary uh, played an important role on curtailing power and protecting human rights and protecting human rights. So there were, so there were constitutional amendments that were very important to this process. 2007, there were constitutional amendments that strengthened uh, human rights and civil liberties in the Turkish constitution. Not a lot, but significantly. In Turkey, it's important to remember, had voluntarily assented to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. So that was a check that uh, uh, on Turkey's power uh, enforcing judicial decisions. And Turkey actually abided by the decisions. When decisions came down against Turkey from the Human Rights Court, Turkey abided by them during this period. <clears throat> but the most important constitutional changes were in 2010. And uh, that uh, was, was very significant in terms of how, in terms of, of putting human rights up front very concretely in the tech, in the constitution of Turkey. It, it, you know, we've, uh, we've heard some discussion already about the, the constitution in South Africa, which is very good. It's one of the best in the world. And uh, these constitutional amendments uh, in Turkey mirrored a lot of those uh, protections that we see in the South African uh, constitution and the human rights portions of the constitution. So that happened in 2010. In fact, there was such an important election uh, that people came back to Turkey, might have been on vacation or were actually making their annual pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, came back in order to vote in these amendments passed resoundingly. Uh, then came, of course, uh, 2016. And probably at this point, Erdogan has already figured out um, the danger to his power uh, from these constitutional amendments, from being subject to the Court of Human Rights. And uh, just dramatically, as uh, Elp pointed out in detail over and over again, basically clamped down on the courts, putting judges in jail who made decisions with which he did not agree, firing clearly at least 4,000 judges, and uh, sidelining all kinds of, uh, uh, all sorts of people involved in the judicial system, including the uh, prosecutors. So, as a, and set up the parallel terrorist courts that Elp mentioned too. I mean, that's just, you know, a rubber stamp again, and taking that power away from the other judges so that they could not act independently and that this, these are basically what we would call kangaroo courts, uh, just uh, putting away people in jail with, with whom the, uh, who Erdogan perceived to be uh, enemies. This list of people who have been, who were lost their jobs all throughout Turkey or uh, were in prison has nothing to do with anything other than being against uh, Erdogan's aggrandizement of power which I agree with ELF is based upon uh, money and uh, aggrandizing uh, money at the, same, at the same time. So now we have the 2017 constitutional amendments that uh, basically pa barely pass and uh, the vote suppression, of course, uh, in this, but the, these 27 amendments, 2017 amendments, what they do is they water down, weaken and do end runs around the constitution as it was amended in 2010. And what I mean by end runs is, uh, and Alp has alluded to this too, is that one of the things the 2010 amendments did 
was to make sure, was to set up a mechanism. So the Supreme Council of Judges and Prosecutors basically appoints or sets in process the appointments of judges and prosecutors. And the 2010 amendments had a way of, of, of breaking that out from the prior way that that's council was structured so that we have more independent uh, input from councils, from uh, associations of lawyers and like that. So it wasn't really just the government forming this, uh, forming the, uh, or selecting the judges in the, in the future. So what Erdogan does in the 2017 amendments is make that group, the independent council, the ind uh, smaller, and also have more appointment power. So essentially Erdogan and his party appoint the majority of that council that in turn appoints the judges, right? So that stripped away any attempt to move to an independent judiciary and made sure that everybody who was selected uh, were cronies of his. The effect of the 27 amendment, 2017 amendments has been, of course, to thoroughly uh, we can virtually destroy any independence whatsoever in the judiciary. And to basically put back into place what uh, existed prior to 20, to, to the year 2000, and that is the judiciary that is totally supine and uh, will implement anything uh, that uh, Erdogan wants. What has also happened that is really tragic in a sense, in the day-to-day -day lives of people is that, of course, the vast majority of cases that are not decided, that are decided, do not involve political or politics or political whims of Erdogan. The problem is the way he has gutted the judiciary and demoralized the judiciary and put in new appointments, the vast majority of these new appointments that are put in are very young lawyers, barely out of law school, maybe out one or two years. They're neophytes. They have no idea what it's like to go through trial processes. And all of a sudden they're judges. And they understand that the reason they're there is because of the government. And so not only do people who litigate in these courts face incompetence, uh, which undermines the quality of civil justice, but they also know that they're not independent. And they also know that they have to make every decision they make has to be something that the government approves. So this Turkey, <clears throat> the judiciary, the judicial system in Turkey is in a really sad uh, situation. It's very unfortunate because there were so many years of uh, promise. I hope that when Turkey returns to that long, hard path to democracy, that this memory of the 10 years uh, will be remembered enough that uh, in reforming Turkey, which hopefully happens as a, and move it toward democracy, uh, that this uh, 10 years of promise of dream uh, will become a reality. Mm -hmm. Having said that, and by way of wrapping this up, I wanna go back to my earlier comment that I think that's what's happening in Turkey is not atypical of what's going on around the world right now in this lack of respect uh, for independent judiciary, not just lack of respect, but the concerted effort to undermine this democratic institution, this democratic idea uh, that we have uh, had for hundreds of years now. And I think it's important for everybody to stand up um, and support the efforts of the people in Turkey. I'm reminded of a quote from Robert Kennedy when he was running for president. <clears throat> Actually, uh, went to South Africa uh, back in the days of apartheid. And in those days of apartheid, of course, meant that the 
<clears throat> the the um, universities were segregated. It meant that uh, he had to choose, was he going to speak at a white university or was he going to speak at a black university, African uh, university? <clears throat> and so what Kennedy did is it, he chose to speak at a uh, white university in Durban. And he did that because he understood that the, it was gonna have to be the white people in power that helped bring about that change. And when he was there uh, talking to the students, uh, he made a uh, really, I think a really important uh, pronouncement uh, that I would like to share. And this comes out of a speech that he gave. It was at the University of Cape Town, uh, June 6, 1966. The greatest danger in our time is timidity. Few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence. Yet, moral courage is the one essential vital quality of those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. Those with the moral courage to enter the moral conflict will find themselves with companions in every corner of the world. Hmm. And it's an honor to be in this corner of the world with you and other corners of the world struggling uh, for justice and human rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you.